The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. So uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Woman of Horror, and uh, our guest is Amy Greck. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thrilled to be here. So, Amy, let's, um, you've never been on the show, so for listeners' first time uh, hearing you, um, where, did, where did Amy come from, and, and how did Amy get into writing and such a dark category, too? Absolutely. Well, I was raised on Long Island and uh, moved to New York City in my 20s. Um, I've lived in the city for 25 years, but because of COVID right now, I'm back on Long Island, but I um, want to move back to the city in the summer. And uh, how did I get into horror? There were a couple of uh, influences. Uh, I was raised Catholic. So a lot of those Bible stories are downright <laughs> terrifying, right? And Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and uh, when I was visiting uh, an aunt with my uh, family who lives in Kingston, New York, she handed me a Stephen King novel. I was 12 at the time, and she handed me uh, Cujo and Pet Cemetery. <laughs> and she said, oh, honey, <laughs> I think you'll love this author. And so, you know, I... I Took the books and thanked her, and I started with Pet Cemetery and then uh, Cujo. And I I never liked big dogs before Cujo, but then that after reading Cujo, I kind of solidified it. <laughs> and those are very dark books. They they are, but um, I was always mature for my age. So my parents didn't say anything like, "Oh, it's not a good idea," you know. <laughs> <laughs> my. My parents wouldn't let me watch Hogan's Heroes. I mean, oh, really? Jeez, I don't know. Uh, so, but 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 there has to be a point where, um, okay, so so you, you're you you love the horror, you are reading it, you like it, but mm -hmm. what is what is the point in your mind or in your in your life that you go, well, I want to write this? Like that's a difference. I mean, you can. There's a lot of people that read a lot of these different books, but they never write it, uh, get into the writing. So, what got you into that? Sure, I've always had an overactive imagination, so that was uh, in my favor. And uh, after reading a couple of Stephen King's novels, I, I said to myself, you know, why, why don't I try my hand at this? And so I started in high school. Um, writing out stories longhand, and then I got a typewriter my junior year of high school. I'm dating myself, but, you know, <laughs> computers were not all the rage quite yet. They were starting to be. And uh, I, I thought to myself, you know, there are not a lot of women writing horror that are alive at the time. This was in the, you know, late 80s, early 90s. And so that's sort of... Um, was the uh, catharsis, if you will, for me seriously trying to write. And then after a couple of years of, of doing it, getting um, starting out getting form rejections back in the old day where you, days where you had to mail your manuscript and, and do the self-addressed stamped envelope. And then I started getting more personalized rejections. So, um, you know, again, that was um, encouraging. And uh, just sort of went from there, and I've been writing ever since. So uh, now, who who? Oh, not, I would say so. Who did? Who is it that you look for um, when you're writing? Like, what kind of a, um, a, what type of horror are you trying to write? Well, that's a good question. My muse does not discriminate. I have uh, published horror, sci-fi hybrid stories, um, extreme horror, psychological horror, ghost stories. It partly depends on what's um, going on in my life at the time because uh, it's not my, the plots of my stories are not my, my life, you know, like word for word per se, but there are definitely some influences, you know, maybe people I know at the time, uh, boyfriend I had at the time who, you know, might have broken up with me and I didn't 
quite get over it. Didn't take it very well, so I uh, <laughs> channeled that into my writing. <laughs> so you're killing the people you don't like, is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes, like many other horror writers I know, yes, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cathartic and it's legal. <laughs> Got any bodies laying around the house that we should know about? That's a... <laughs> oh, I, I don't, I don't kiss and tell. No, <laughs> <laughs> she's got, she's got the acid bath going on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, what, does old horror uh, um, influence you more? Like, what, if I was to give you a choice between horror from, let's say, the um, 40s, 50s, and 60s, as, as compared to what it's been like in the 2000s. Um, do you have a preference? And by preference, do you mean which has influenced me more as uh, an author person? Yeah. yeah, which do you think um, feeds you more as an author? Like, uh, is it kind of the old-time stories done by classics, or is it kind of more modern day? Well, I would say that it's kind of a, a mix for me. Uh, of course, Frankenstein, Mary Shelley, uh, Shirley Jackson, The Lottery, um, H.P. Lovecraft. Interesting tidbit, I have the same birthday as Lovecraft, August 20th, different centuries. Um, and uh, But then, as I mentioned, I, I read a lot of Stephen King growing up. And then I discovered other authors, um, Dean Koontz, and then uh, women, uh, contemporary women of the genre, Joyce Carol Oates, I would even yeah. consider a, a horror author, even though a lot of her work is very contemporary, for example. Absolutely. So are you H.P. Yeah. Lovecraft reincarnated? <laughs> no, I, no, I'm not. I'm not. Um, you know, I'm not a racist. I'm not. You know, no. <laughs> well, you know, maybe a modern day version. I, you know, I know very little about him. I started listening to him just this last, uh, I'd say, in the last year, last eight months. I had oh, never yeah. ever read or any of that stuff before, and it's fascinating. I, I find it very. Uh, I, I, I like it for the most part. Uh huh. So, oh, yeah, it is fascinating, the Cthulhu mythos. Actually, where I uh, went to uh, undergrad college, Ithaca College, there was I was an English major, creative writing minor, no surprise. But I mention it because one of the elective courses was the literature of horror. So that's where I yep. discovered uh, Franz Kafka, The Metamorphosis, H.P. Lovecraft, Call of the Cthulhu, and others. Uh, so, um, yeah, I was, was fortunate that... Uh, that was something avail available to me at a, another, still an impressionable age, uh, late teens, early twenties. Well, that's interesting, but because you're, 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 you you talk about some of these classics. Um, do you think that the we have those types of classics being written now? Yes, I would say that we have uh, modern day equivalents. Uh, I mean, talking about Lovecraft. Uh, Love, you know, Lovecraft Country. I don't know if you saw that series on uh, HBO. No. Um, but I haven't it, watched it yet. No, it's really intense. I, I recommend it. Um, I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's very, uh, very multi layered, uh, like an onion, but in a good way. I never had a good onion. <laughs> well, just an analogy I like to give people. I actually don't really care to eat onions, but, you know, it's one of those visual analogies that works, if you will. Yeah. Well, since we, we brought up Lovecraft, mm -hmm. um, and you've written, I think, over 100, well, published over 100 short stories. Yes. Um, do you feel more comfortable writing in the short form? I do, but um, recently I have also published a, a couple of novellas. A um, couple of years ago, a small publisher, New Pulp Press, uh, published a collection of mine that has two novellas. One is a crime novella actually set in New York City, um, entitled Rage Redemption in Alphabet City, which is also the title of the collection. And then for some reason, the publisher wanted a dystopian novella, which really didn't go with the rest. 
Um, but that was uh, fun to write. So I'm I'm trying to to stretch my um, my my creativity and and still create uh, engaging characters and and plot lines. Um, so I'm I'm getting there. I'm I'm not just uh, I'm not adverse to writing a novel. I just haven't haven't gotten there yet. Excellent. So when you talk about um, now, this is I, I see you're in that um, the one that got away, and it's Woman of Horror, yes. Volume Three. So now, uh, this is something fairly new to me. Um, explain mm-hmm. what is Woman of Horror, and what what are you what are you guys accomplishing by doing these um, com- compilations of books? Sure, of Women in, in Horror Month has uh, been around for twelve years. And it started as a way to to just celebrate um, women who are successful, whether it's their authors or their filmmakers or screenwriters. Uh, and for some reason, they picked February. February is kind of a crowded month. Um, we have Valentine's Day. We have Black History Month. So there's actually talk in the genre of um, moving it to a, a different month. I mean, I every month is Women in Horror Month, as far as I'm concerned. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but the anthology that you mentioned is actually um, all female authors published, and it's a uh, a press. I'm, I might be saying the name of the press incorrectly. It's a uh, Can Candasha Press, and. Um, it's uh, run by by women as well, so it's uh, a lot of um, girl power at once. What, what, so, what, what do you think it is? Do you think that um, is there an issue with people believing a woman can write a good horror? Not so much anymore, uh, because. I, I touched upon an article that I that I wrote uh, for um, StokerCon, the StokerCon souvenir book in, in 2019. Linda Addison was um, editing it that year, and I uh, emailed her. We've been friends for years, and, and I said, Linda, I'd, I'd love to, to write up uh, an essay about the trials and tribulations of being a woman in horror and uh, persevering and being successful. And she loved the idea. And um, then about a year and a half later, I uh, found this platform called Medium Online, which it's monetized. So you, you get money when, when people, it's the equivalent of liking something. It's, it's clapping on that platform. So um, I keep updating the uh, essay. It's called Dangerous Games, Women Who Write Horror, because there's over 200 women worldwide now publishing, um, whether it's short stories, novellas, novels, poems. So it's uh, it's really, I don't want to say it's become mainstream yet, but I don't really think people are adverse to picking up a book or even like, for example, the one that got away anthology, we have nine five star reviews on Amazon already. And it came out about a month ago. So uh, I think people are, are really embracing uh, women in the uh, horror genre even more now. No. Okay. No, don't take this wrong, but does, does a, um, a woman write differently than a man? in horror or is that just a totally off base question no it's a perfectly valid question and um i've been on a couple of panels at different conventions where we we talked about it live in real life and um so on on the podcast here what i would say to that is um women are Usually by nature, I don't want to say all women, but most women are are more attuned to emotions and conveying emotions um, within their work, whether it's intense uh, emotions of joy that turn into uh, to grief for whatever reason, if that helps. 
Yeah, I was just yeah, because I'm not. You see, I'm I'm from the true crime area, and and uh-huh. that's that's what I write. So cool. I, I don't really notice. Um, I don't know if there's a difference in female writing or not, as compared to male. Maybe there is, but because we we're writing kind of, we don't get to choose what we write. It's sort of, it's sort of the fact that you're portraying, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, so, and I think not so much the writing itself, but maybe a different story. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I'm probably going to get hate mail for this, but I, what I'm trying to figure out is, is do you have a different sto- story? Um, as a man like is that just like can you can you read um like if i read the one that got away if i'm reading that mm-hmm. uh, oh boy see that's I, I so i don't get screamed at but does that <laughs> would i know i'm reading females writing stories and 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 i don't mean that in a derogatory way i'm not trying to be mean or mm-hmm. try to be uh, stuff but do you guys does a female write from a different point of view in the story I I think by and large that we do, but actually some of the contributors to the anthology are um, transgender and they identify as female. And I haven't had a chance to read the entire anthology yet, but I, I did read a piece by, by one of the um, transgender authors and it, it still um, resonated as, as being... Uh, written by a a female, uh, I don't want to say mindset, but like a female perspective from a female perspective. Mm. Yeah, it's all very new to me. Um, Mm -hmm. So, so when you, when you put together a story, like when you're writing a story, um, one of your, one of your stories, Mm -hmm. where does that come from? Like, uh, there's there's a lot of different influences. A lot of my work takes place in New York City because I've lived there for over 25 years. And um, one winter it was snowing and I was walking through Central Park with a friend. And so that's actually the uh, setting of my story, Cold Comfort, which appears in the One That Got Away anthology. And in that story I also um, deal with... Uh, grieving over a, a boyfriend I had in college who actually I thought we were going to get married and he didn't feel the same way. So I, uh, I wrote him up as, as a guy who uh, is in a relationship in the story, but you know, he wants to uh, explore other experiences with other women. So he um, hooks up with this woman at a bar and uh, she's really kinky, and she takes them home and ties them up. And and then there's a lot of um, there's a lot of fun stuff I do with uh, with rope, and not not just uh, in the bedroom. I don't want to ruin the story, but there's uh, quite a twist that a lot of people who read the story didn't see coming, which is always satisfying. I, I just okay. So when you when you do a story, but is there an underlying thing that you want people to get from the story? Uh, yeah, like, but I, I'm not conscious of it necessarily when I'm writing it until after I've finished the story, and then I go back. Uh, I try to write the first draft almost stream of consciousness, and then I I go back. I let it sit for a, like a week or two, or maybe longer, and then I go back to it. And I'll um, I'll edit it for logic issues and things like that. So it's for me, it's not even obvious what what the uh, what the messages of the of the story until I've spent some time with it. Hmm. I, I, now, so and your characters, like when you have somebody in there, um, mm-hmm. are they people that you? totally make up in your mind is it people you've met in a coffee shop someone i mean obviously your your ex-boyfriend you want to kill him but (laughs) but besides that i mean the different characters in your in your story um where do they come from and how do you know how they're going to act and react 
You see, that's kind of the difference for me. You see, because in true crime, we kind of get the facts and we know, okay, this guy did this to this person. And we, we kind of know what they did and how they reacted. And we probably ask the question, I wonder why they reacted this way. But mm-hmm. your story, so how do you, because you're creating that complete storyline. How do you know what your characters are going to do? For me, actually, um, like you were saying, uh, I have written some some crime stories and novellas that have been published, and they are kind of different because I, I sort of start with, like, what was the crime, and then I work backwards, like, what led up to it. That's, that's my methodology with, with the crime fiction that I write. But my horror... I, I'm along for the ride. It's almost like when I'm writing it, it's like I'm watching a movie, but I don't, I don't know what's, what's going to happen until I'm, it sort of happens in real time and I'm along for the ride. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just, I, I find that a fascinating part of writing. And I guess mm-hmm. horror is no different than um, anything else. Um, do you want people to get something out of your writing? Like, so if I sit down and I'm reading the uh, um, the um, one that got away and I'm reading the different compilations and the stories and I get to your story and I read it, mm-hmm. do you want me to have, is there something you want me to get out of that story at the end of the end of the book? Yeah, I want the story to, to resonate with the readers um, long after they've finished and they're, they're uneasy because maybe they, um, Either they live in New York City or they visit and they have walked through Central Park during a, a snowstorm in the winter. And now the next time that happens, they're going to be looking over their shoulder and they're going to be wondering <laughs> if what happened in the story might possibly happen to them. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a sort of evoke a, a feeling of dread that, that wasn't there in their, in their real lives. Well, so you want people to suffer. Well, I want them to, <laughs> but it's sort of like, it's sort of comfortable suffering because they're not going to be physically injured directly from reading my stories unless they get a paper cut, actually, <laughs> if they're reading that paperback. <laughs> well, that's, that could be a good thing, too, right? Um, yeah. Wow. So that's, that's really interesting. So where do you see yourself going with all this? Well, I've got... Um, a lot of stories that I'm currently working on. I'm uh, putting the uh, finishing touches on a second crime novella that I have written that's set in New York City. It was with a publisher for a year. I won't say who, but I will say that the um, terms of the contract ran out. Their year, their year was up. The contract was they had a year to publish my novella, and then they didn't. So I asked for my rights back, and they gave them back to me. Um, I mean, my muse doesn't discriminate. I have a, a poem in an anthology that just came out a few weeks ago that's called Hell's Malls. It's uh, different stories set in uh, suburban or urban malls. And all kinds of uh, mayhem ensues. And my my poem is entitled Orange Julius, so it's uh, <laughs> you know very eighties. And then I I go back in my mind to all the stores that were in malls in the eighties, KB Toys and Walden Books. And I don't want to ruin the uh, surprise of the poem, but I'll just say that there's a disgruntled employee who um, who's sort of. Uh, has a field day in the mall. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you know, it's funny. Orange Julius, I remember that in the 60s. <laughs> yes. Well, I grew up in the 80s, so um, you could still get them at Dairy Queen, at least in New York City. So, but it's not a standalone brand anymore. Right. I guess Dairy Queen absorbed them or something. <laughs> Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of that with those fast food places. They seem to be joining up. I guess it's split the rent and sell your stuff. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, so if if someone – okay, so we're talking Amy Grepp, Um And someone say, well, what should I read? I've never read Amy before. So what do you suggest? So what, what would be the, the thing you would say – 
represents you most for? Well, it would depend on uh, what what that individual likes. I, for example, I have a uh, science fiction horror hybrid story, EV two thousand, that was published in uh, a publication called um, Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. It came out last summer, summer of twenty twenty. Um, you know, it, it really depends. Does, or maybe there's someone else who likes ghost stories. I have uh, quite a few of those that have been published. One takes place in a castle. So it all, it all depends on uh, the reader's preference. Hmm. Well, and, and who would you, uh, besides me, who would you most like to work with? <laughs> If you would you like to work with another writer, or is there somebody you'd love to work with? Oh boy! Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, yeah, I um, I actually did uh, collaborate with an author in the early oh no mid two thousands, uh, Michael McCarthy. Uh, McCarthy. He's um, published a lot of uh, a lot of books and short stories. And we, we wrote this um, novella, and it was called Fallen Angel, and um, it got pretty decent reviews, but then the publisher folded, and we, we didn't do anything um, with it to try to get it out there again. But that was a fascinating process, collaborating and, and getting our, our voices to, to mesh so the reader couldn't tell who wrote this chapter. Was it Amy or was it Michael? Um, you know, uh, so that's it's something I would be open to again, but, uh, you know, I, I, I would be open to, to working with, with any author if, if I feel our, our voices would, would mesh effectively, but I can't think of any, I don't want to put any, any of the other writers out there on the spot, if you will. <laughs> mm, yeah. So. Okay. Now, okay. Do do you have a, a website or a place people can go and find you and find out about you and your writing and all the information? Maybe stalk you. Maybe <laughs> send you a mail for a date. You know. I, you know. They have to be careful. You don't treat them well. If yeah, that's that, that's right. I uh, <laughs> I do have a website. It's uh, crimsonscreams dot com. And I'm also very active on Twitter. And on Twitter, my handle is just uh, Amy underscore, underscore Grek. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to have that on our website as well. So people that are listening to this or listen, they can do one click and they can find you and uh, mm-hmm. ask you out on a date or whatever. <laughs> at um, their own peril, yes. At their own peril. Well, as long as they treat you good, it's okay. Okay. That's right. right. It's, just, it's when they get into the bad stuff. I mean, but they will be killed in the story. Yeah, yes. well, it might even go further. You never know. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, she's in New York. I mean, come on. Yeah. Now, um, so, you know, with all the weird stuff and being in um, such a busy center, like being around New York and all that stuff, um, mm-hmm. has the COVID and, and all of the this last year of 2020, it's, it's a, has that caused you a lot of stress, and, and does that kind of get into your writing? Does that fuel you to write even more? Uh, yeah, let me uh, backtrack really briefly. Uh, right before the pandemic, I had um, severe gallstones. So I had my gallbladder out like two oh. weeks before New York City was under lockdown. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, and my day job, I'm a uh, full-time freelance uh, digital strategist. I do online marketing for various clients, but a lot of them couldn't work, like doctors. I worked with a cosmetic surgeon, and he couldn't uh, perform procedures because they weren't, you know, like essential surgeries, like saving someone's life with a heart operation. So, uh Everything kind of stopped for me at once, and uh, I was unfortunate that my mother has a house on Long Island, and that's where I am right now, but I'm able to um, be more creative because I don't, you know, people don't have to go places the way we used to, and, and don't get me wrong, I miss it horribly, 
you know, being able to go out with my friends for dinner, go see a movie, Broadway show. Uh, you know, I won't list all the litany of things that we can't do anymore right now. But, yeah, I do find myself being extra creative and um, really cranking out, like I said, some poems. And I actually uh, sold a six-word story to uh, an online publication. I uh, signed a contract, but I'll say... Um, Keep an eye on my website for the announcement, the official announcement for that. Well, that's great. I don't have great. a publication date for that one yet. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. That's really yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, and and but but do you find like when things around you in your life um, are dark, or let's say you know the you know the boyfriend who's being an ass and all that <laughs> stuff, does that does that make you kind of go darker in your writing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When I have um, fuel from my real life, whether it's something like a bad breakup or uh, right now I consider myself to be displaced and living in exile in the suburbs. I'm not wired for the suburbs. I don't drive. Um, I, like I walked to the drugstore earlier to pick up a few things and Car drivers look at me like I'm a unicorn because I'm not <laughs> driving and I'm walking on the shoulder of the of the road. <laughs> well, you know, you know that's how it is, right? Each area has their own sort of thing, and you know, just finger yeah. them, just show them the finger. That's all. <laughs> yeah, well, no, because uh, I won't say this is like the deep south where people have rifle racks, but I you never know who's got a weapon, so I don't want some wackadoo to, to really pull a gun on me in real life. You know, I, it's, it's fine. I've written a bunch of stories with different guns, and actually I've, I've done my homework because once I, I wrote a story and, and the gun that I referenced didn't have a safety on it, and then someone said, yeah, you need to change the gun or you need to rewrite that, someone who knew about guns. So I learned that, you know, uh, don't take research Lightly, do your homework because someone's going to call you out on details, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. It feels like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's well. I think it's the most important thing. The worst thing in the world is is a story that um, gets detailed wrong. When that happens, it throws me. Uh huh. You know, you know uh, and that doesn't yeah. matter what kind of story, whether it's uh, fiction, nonfiction. It can be horror. It can be anything. I mean, you know. Uh, Wonder Woman having an accent, yeah. <laughs> and she didn't the have one. Movie? The new movie that just came out. Yeah, she has an accent, yeah. and yet when she's a kid, she doesn't have an accent. Exactly. <laughs> okay, yeah. that throws me. So here I am getting bothered and trying to figure it out throughout the whole thing, and I miss it all because I'm so worked up. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so that really bothers me when they do that. Um, you know. Um, there's so many things. Um, so anyway, so yeah, it's really important. I think it's the most important thing to to a story is is those details. Mm -hmm. Definitely, the devil is in the details. To coin a phrase. Yeah, because what was that? That was that other one that um, nurse ratchet um, <laughs> show. Uh -huh. And yep. the thing is, and how they were talking about the uh, electric chair and all that, but they had never done electrocutions by at that time. Oh, see, I didn't know that. I did watch Nurse Ratchet on Netflix last year when it was out. But yeah, yeah, that was, I could see where that could be uh, irritating if if one did know that 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 was a big uh, whoopsie daisy on their their part. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's that's that things like that, or uh, if you if you're in that true crime area, you start to realize and you go, well, that's no, that's it couldn't be. So they didn't. Somebody didn't check, and so it, it, it's becomes part of the story and then you're kind of like oh mm -hmm. so it throws you a little bit i mean i i i still liked it but that did throw mm -hmm. me you know it could you know but yeah you know exactly but anyway well it's been a real pleasure having you on the show it's been a pleasure talking to you and Thank um you. Mm -hmm. and um we'll have you back again anything exciting happens let us know i will thank you for having me it's been a pleasure and uh stay safe take care thanks amy all right, thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. <laughs>
Street. The end. By George, he's got it. It is the end. I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. 